Hello, 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 everyone. This is your favorite personal growth coach, Dr. Nick. And you know, I'm always excited to be with you every Wednesday right here, 830 Eastern Standard Time, where we are equipping, empowering, and, and, and empowering and inspiring young people to see, own, and achieve their dreams. So if you are out there, let me know. Say hello. Uh, let me know that you are watching. If you are watching for the first time, uh, I guess I guess to do an official uh, introduction. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Nicole Rankin. I am the CEO of the Cole Academy of Personal Growth, and we are a, a training and development company for students. And what we do, we provide students with the soft skills that they need for success. We train them in leadership development, personal growth, and communication to help with their social emotional learning so they will be successful in today's society. And not only do we train students, we also train the educational leaders that support them. So that's a little bit about me and how we got to adulting in my purpose. We started this movement back in April when we were uh, started, the, the pandemic started and businesses were shut down and we had to social distance. We had to quarantine and stay home. And I had to figure out what to do. I had to make a pivot. All right. So it was let on my heart uh, to do something special for our millennials and and that uh, group that I work with. And because I, I always found that a lot of the millennials that I worked with, they were all in the same space. They were feeling stuck, uh, frustrated, overwhelmed, not knowing what to do, not know, well, knowing what the next step was, but just needing some help and guidance. So I uh, um, launched this movement um, out of the, the work that I did with uh, my journal, Adulting in My Purpose, that's available on Amazon.com. It's a personal growth journey um, that you go through in a journal form. It helps you write down, asking you the right questions that you need to help you uh, understand who you are, increase your self-awareness, increase um, your self-knowledge of yourself to truly build a foundation of life that you can use to guide you to your next level. So this Adulting in my purpose is geared for that millennial group. So we have started in April and we've been grow going strong, uh, giving strategies, giving teaching sessions. And uh, last month I decided that, you know, we have to shift. We have to do something new. As entrepreneurs, we're always creating. And we wanted to add some new segments um, to adulting in my purpose. And this one is another uh, new segment that we add, Millennials on the Move. And we started it uh, two weeks ago where we had the brand, the co-owners of the brand and the and business, business and the brand, uh, Terrence uh, Height and Bridget Joy. And that was phenomenal. If you missed that, catch the replay, um, go back and watch it. They gave some great nuggets uh, being in uh, as millennials and being in the business world for those that are entrepreneurs. And we're just going to continue uh, to bring some great millennials who are do out there doing it, truly making moves uh, truly uh, adulting in their purpose and doing the things that they know that they feel that they have been called to do. So if you're out there, go ahead, like, share, start your watch parties, get your questions ready because we have an amazing, amazing guest with us tonight. And I will bring her out. Welcome, welcome to Adulting in My Purpose. Hello, hey, Danielle Butler. Hello, hello, Dr. Nick loves the kids and she loves me. I'm happy to be here. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So let me tell you guys, let me let me share with you a little bit because our special guest is not only doing things and, and, and making moves, but she has a personal spark in my heart. We've known each other for, hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that okay. part. Yeah, at that part, we have known each other for quite a while and have grown. Uh, we started out with dance and started out with ministry, but have truly grown to be sisters. And I've seen her evolve, uh, starting with vision, starting with purpose, starting with the understanding of what she has, is wants to do and just truly honing in, going after it and making things happen. And I couldn't be so proud of her and the growth that she has and the things that she's doing. So 
E. Daniel Butler. She is, and I have a laundry list of things that I can read from her bio. Uh, she is a ghostwriter. She started an independent publishing company. She's a writer. She's an author. Uh, she truly has a passion to help people find their voice and, and share knowledge. Uh, so she is truly um, have a, a plethora of, of clients where she is birthing authors, you know, so it, it's amazing to help people have, find their voice to help people see their vision and to come and to make it pass into books, into journals. Uh, she is a develop, personal developmental coach. Uh, she is a dancer. She has so many, <laughs> so many, so many things that we can say. So I just want to welcome you to Adulting in My Purpose, Danielle. And just to get started, tell us, tell us your story. Tell us how you got started. And I, I, I don't want to leave this out. I, I forgot that she was a mom of two, y'all. She's a mompreneur. <laughs> can't, for, can't forget Zach and Zoe, right? So Please tell us. I know, right? <laughs> they'll, they'll get me. <laughs> but tell, tell the audience, just tell us how you got started and, and a little bit more about yourself. Sure. So um, as Dr. Nick mentioned, I'm E. Danielle Butler. I am the founder and CEO of Evie Danny Books, which is an independent publishing firm here in Atlanta. Um, and we are also home to the award-winning children's book series, The Adventures of Zoe and Zachary. Um, in terms of getting started, so I've been writing for it as long as I can remember. Um, I was one of those people that had the dream of maybe being a writer, but wasn't sure what that looked like long term. And of course, when you're young and growing up, everybody's like, go to school, get a good job, right? You get married, you have kids, and then you die. Um, and so I've done all of the other good, safe careers. Um, and, and writing is the one that has been consistent, has been my consistent companion. And so the last few years, I have taken a, a big leap of faith in terms of working for myself, and it has been the most rewarding and challenging experience of my life outside of parenting because, oh, my gosh. Um, and then parenting comes below adulting, which is a whole nother set of, oh, my goshes. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've been spending time writing, ghost writing, as you mentioned. So that is telling people stories for them and then backing away as if I never had anything to do with it uh, for both leaders and for organizations. And then though there have been those that I've been blessed to partner with in helping share, shape and share their stories. We all have a story and, and I believe that there's more, there is more to those stories. Um, we just have to get confident enough to either write them or to tell them or to share them. And that's what I do. I love it. I love it. Having the passion to help people tell their stories. So I know we've had this discussion <laughs> and I, I know it, 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 it might be a thorn in the flesh that we have this word millennials mm -hmm. and you technically you are a millennial, but again, we're on the, the, the end of the cusp, the, the spectrum, right? So what does the biggest challenge of being a millennial and establishing yourself in the world, what can you say that is for you? So here's, here's the, the interesting thing. We had this conversation um, because millennials have gotten a really bad rep. They right? have. They as have. being flaky, as being indecisive, um, as feeling entitled to something. There are a lot of negative adjectives and attribute, attributes that have been ascribed to millennials. And so I think that has been a challenge is being like, all right, but I'm not those things, right? Mm -hmm. Like I am a passionate person that believes that if it's not serving me well, it's okay to move on. Um, and so I think other generations have found that they have ascribed that whole flightiness or inconsistent piece to millennials when really it's more about just saying, hey, it didn't work and I don't have to stick with it for 30, 50, 100 years. Like it didn't work. It's not for me yeah. and I'm OK um, with that. So that has definitely been a challenge. Um, another challenge has probably been trying to find the balance between being a millennial that has all of that freedom that embraces all of the wonderful things about being a millennial yet still having some values of the previous generations you know still holding close and true family and stability um and so i would probably say that that's probably the greatest challenge is striking the balance between older values and present passions 
That's a good question. I'm going to steal that for someone else later. I like that. Striking the, I love that answer. Striking the values between older passions and present. Older values and present older, passions. Yeah. Older values and present passions. I think I'm going to use that one. Okay. <laughs> I'll All give right. you credit. I'll give you credit. I'll give you credit. You know, a little bit. A little Just bit. Just a little bit. So I love that. So when we think about, you know, like you said, there are many negative connotations with millennials, but millennials are out there doing it. They're creating their own life. They're they're going against the grain. They're going against the traditional map and the traditional yeah. journey um, that many people may want them to go. And they're kind of carving out their their own life. Right. So when you think about your life and what you have gone through, you know, how does that, what does that look like as far as, you know, that perfect week, that perfect environment to live? So here's the thing. I think that for me, there is a balance, an ebb and flow between time and freedom to enjoy the things that I value, which is family. Um, I value rest heavily. I value being able to recharge and rejuvenate. Whereas there has been this almost like a constant push and connect to remain connected that mm -hmm. has has it's been hard to deprogram from that. Um, since I was 14 years old, I've worked. I've always worked. I've worked two, three, seven jobs at a time. Um, and so trying to figure out that balance of I don't have to have a job from seven to three and another one from five to nine and then have a hustle from 10 to 12 or one o'clock in the morning to get up to do it all over again. Um, and so for me, looking at that week, that week is if I can be productive in three days or four days, that's ideal for me. Mm. If, I can, if I can make magic and truly be focused <laughs> in three or four days and then have the rest to recharge to connect with family, to help someone else out with something, you know, there, um, people need things. Yeah. Um, even in this pandemic, it has become a challenge to kind of figure out being there for people and what support looks like. And so I, I crave and love and embrace the flexibility to support people in a way that is meaningful to them. So my ideal week gives me time to check in on friends and make sure that they are supported and have the things they need. It gives me time to, to be present for my kids, to be silly. Um, we built a, um, what do you call the thing? An air hockey table tonight out of... Oh out of a laundry basket and a tub top <laughs> and a couple I of things. It. But if I had been plugged into my phone or having to work and doing the whole rat race thing, I don't know that I would have spent 10 minutes on the floor figuring out how not to get bust in the face before an interview. Right. Like, right. Um, so those things are of value to me um, as we have switched school is back in mm -hmm. and I have a friend that is a teacher and she also has a kindergartner. And so how is she online teaching her middle school students at the same time as making sure that her kindergartner gets everything that she needs? And so we had another friend that was like, hey, I've got the flexibility at my job. I'm coming over two days a week to sit in class with her so that you can do your job. Mm. And for me, that's the ultimate week to be able to say, all right, well, <laughs> two, I, you got two days. I got two days. Let's get somebody else to get a day and we'll make the, we'll call this thing a week. So I think that's the ideal week is one that has the productivity, but also the flexibility. I so love it. A winded answer, but no, that I love it. I love it. Productivity and the flexibility, because we're seeing a lot of um, even millennials. They're moving away from that traditional role and traditional jobs because of that, that that they don't want that rigid nine to five or ten to four or seven to seven to three. You know, they want that flexibility to because, like as you said, if you can do the same work mm -hmm. uh, of an eight hour day in four hours, yeah. why not? Right. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 a whole mindset uh, and shift that we're seeing with this generation. So I want to talk about because you mentioned your children, and and I know both both of your lovely children. And but there are I, there are a lot of millennials out there that I have encountered with children, and they may be single moms. So can you speak to 
the single mom out there with children and who are wanting to adult in their purpose, find their, find their, their, their purpose and, but still have to be a mom. Yeah. So that is one of my passions, right? Is figuring out how to do this thing. And for so long, we as women have been told you have to find the perfect balance. It's all about balance. You can have it all, but it's all about balance. When I became a mom, I threw that notion of balance out the window, right? Mm -hmm. Because here's the analogy that I use. I can be a mom. I can go to work during my said work hours, do the work that I'm supposed to do. But if at any moment that phone rings and my child needs something, regardless of what work I'm doing, my mind is, uh, whether I have to get up and leave the desk or not, the moment I see that the school is calling or the babysitter is calling, my mind is automatically in mom mode. I'm no longer being a good employee or a good worker or a good leader. Like my mind is simply shifts to being a mom. And so one of the things that I encourage moms to do is stop looking for the balance. There's no such mm -hmm. thing right? The idea is that life is a mashup and that you lean in the direction of what is pushing the most at any given moment. So again, if I'm on a conference call, but then a kid bursts in the door, regardless of what call, what conversation we're having, that kid bursting in the door is pushing into my space, is pushing into my mental space, my physical space. And so it's no longer a balance. It's not me sitting here like this as though nothing's happening off screen. Um, yeah. It is me leaning back a little bit and saying, okay, all right, you know, like let's, let's figure this out and then I can figure this out. And once they step back outside of the door, then I'm able to lean back into this conversation. So I think that that piece of advice would be to nix the idea of balance. There is no mm. such thing. It doesn't exist. It is a mashup. What is pressing most today gets your attention, right? I love it. Press and try to lean away from it and try to ignore it. It's just going to cause you pain and discomfort. So why not lean back into it? What, what's pressing me this way? If I lean this way with it, it's cool. Versus it pressing me this way and I'm struggling. This is when I drown is when mm -hmm. all of the things are pressing against me. This is when I, as a mom, find myself doggy paddling because I'm like, I'm choking. I'm, I'm choking here because all of my things, all of my commitments are pushing in and I'm pushing in a different direction. So throw out the idea of balance. It doesn't exist. I love it. <laughs> throw it. Just throw it out. Throw, just it, throw out. it out. It's not, <laughs> you know, it's not real. I love it. Our life is a mashup. Mm -hmm. I love it learn to deal with what is priority at the time. Yeah. I, I, I love it. That, that helps you put things into perspective because there's always going to be something going on. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be something happening. So I love that, that mindset. And thinking about that, as a, as a business owner, as a mom, you're a wife, you do other things in your church. And, you know, so I'm all about personal growth and development, right? So I believe that, you know, personal growth is is truly the foundation of life in every area of your life. So what are some of the things that you do to help you with personal growth and development? Yeah, so I'm an avid reader. Mm -hmm. I love reading. Um, that is my number one thing. I've got I'm looking at my desk now like this is embarrassing if they could see this with the number of books that are stacked up. But really, um, I crave knowledge to the point that I seek it out, right? Mm -hmm. I don't let it just find me. Um, I love podcasts. I am really heavy into those because I can I can do something else. Like when something, I can listen to a podcast or listen to music or whatever while I'm doing something else. So it's a dual purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a big fan of personal development in a group or a one-on-one -on -one setting. I don't believe that everything that we need comes through just reading a book or just listening to a podcast. We need accountability partners, mm -hmm. um, mastermind groups. I participated in one with you a couple of years ago that was tremendous um, to sit down with other people that are either where you're looking to go or they're growing with you at the same time. Yeah. And so personal development for me is finding a tribe or a group or a community that allows me to grow and learn and also being flexible enough to know that just because I joined this group in 2020, you know, it may not serve me the same way as it will in 2021 or as it would have if I had embarked on it on 2018. So I would say that probably at least once a year, I participate in some sort of mastermind or retreat um, to really make sure that I'm staying 
accountable to what I say my goals are and my goal is to grow. So making sure that I'm doing something towards that, what is the focus area and then seeking out things that support me in that area. I love it. So we have reading, podcasts, Mm -hmm. group accountability, masterminds, and you mentioned a retreat. So guys, here are some some, um, suggestions. If you don't have a regimen of personal growth, personal growth is not a part. These are some of the things that you can do on a daily basis um, to truly continue to pour into you, to help you elevate your mindset, to help you just release. And I and I love the fact you've said before that you value rest. So I know there's some self-care in there as well um, that's a part of your personal growth and development. So let me rewind in and, you know, talking about the the, ne- the negative connotations with millennials that, that we out there. What are some suggestions um, that you would give leaders with engaging uh, millennials now, kind of bridging the, the gap between the generations? Oh, that's a good one. Um, the first one is probably talk to us and not at us. Mm. Sometimes there's this uh, assumption that we're we're younger. Yes, that is the fact. But the truth is that I may be more familiar with some things than you are and vice versa. And so our conversation should be just that, a conversation, mm. a dialogue, an exchange. Um, so many times I have seen maybe where an organization is headed in one way because they've been doing things the same way over and over and over again, getting the same results. But it takes a millennial to say, but what if we try this? What mm-hmm. if there's another possibility or another opportunity? Um, and so that would be my first one is to talk with them, talk to them, talk to us, not them, us. I'm a <laughs> yes, yes, you are. <laughs> I'm a millennial. I'm owning it tonight. I'm a millennial on the I move. <laughs> talk to us. That's talk right. to us um, would be my first one. Um the second one would probably be to trust us hmm. um, because we we think a lot outside of the box. We think very, I don't want to say incongruently, but we think over space and over time. We don't necessarily think linearly. Hmm. And I think that gives us a significant advantage. I don't always have to think. A to Z. I can think A to Z with a couple of twos and a 17 thrown in between, right? And that's going to give me a different outcome than just going A to Z. Um, There are many ways to get to the same place that we're all trying to go. And so if you just trust that my GPS, my life GPS works just as well as yours, Mm -hmm. we're going to do it. We are mm-hmm. going to get there. We might have a few more bumps and bruises, or we might see some some more beautiful sights along the way. Um, so trust us to to know and believe that we got this thing. We're going. We're gonna make it. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah, talk with us and, and trust us. That that's powerful um, that you say that because a lot of times when as leaders, I I do a training of. Um, we talk about leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. But a lot of times people think uh, when they think of leadership, they think of positional leadership, people with titles and, and status. So it's I'm a leader because I have a title and that's all. Then it stops right there. So it's you do what I say. This is how it goes. You know, there's no engagement. There's no feedback there. But, you know, we have a generation of, of millennials that that's a no go. You know, when when that happens, millennials shut down and we're seeing a lot of that in the workplace. We're seeing that um, with work turnover is at an ultimate high with this generation because of that mindset um, as leaders. It's that that positional leadership. So the fact that you said trust us. Right. Although we're young, we have ideas. You know, you may have that million dollar idea to take that company to the next level. But as leaders, we have to be open. We have to be vulnerable and trust um, the value that you bring to a company, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you hit the nail on the head when you talked about um, the idea that the job turnover is like significant right now. It's Mm -hmm. crazy um, Mm -hmm. in the millennial generation. Here's what I know. One of the CEOs that I work with, he stated it and it was so beautiful. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. If every leader could lead lead this way. He said, opportunity does not have to mean struggle. Mm. 
And for so long, prior generations have been used to doing things the hard way because that's just the way it was. Or we get into the situation and we stick it out because that's just the way it is. And millennials are like, there's a whole other world out there. If you just turn your head to the left or to the right, you know, you can see something else. So I don't have to come and stay at your job for 40 years in a pension and you're treating me like trash. You know, mm. I don't have to come and commit 25 years to your job to make a certain money, a certain amount of money in retirement. So I don't have to commit 25 years of misery in hopes of 20 years later of satisfaction living on the check that you've given me. I want to be happy now and I want to be happy later. And it doesn't have to be an either or scenario. It doesn't have to be that I struggle to wake up to come to work every day. And I'm, you know, you're nagging me because you're a leader and you feel like I'm not moving the way you want me to lead. And I'm resenting you because you're a leader that doesn't listen to me, even though I feel like I have leadership in me that can be cultivated. And all of this is because every two weeks you're going to deposit this check to me. And out of that check is going to be some money that when I'm 60. What is it? 64? 63. 60. When I'm in my 60s, mm -hmm. 30 years from now, after I've given you all of these days of resentment, that I'll be happy to walk away from you and get a small portion of what you've been giving me over time. I don't know. That sounds crazy. Wow. Wow. <laughs> now, when you put it like that, right? Yeah, when you put it like that, it <laughs> when you put like, it like that right? Absolutely. I'm 25 years of misery, right? Of, of discomfort of me waking up at a time that doesn't agree with my body mm -hmm. to come in, to clock in, to do whatever I'm going to do for you, to have you tell me what you want to tell me, how you want to tell me, rarely ask me anything. Maybe I'll have an opportunity for advancement, but all I'm doing it for is that 30 years from now, I can cash in on that. Mm -hmm. It's not a fair trade. And I think that millennials have, have a keen understanding of that. That opportunity does not have to mean struggle. I love it. Opportunity does not have to mean struggle. So leaders, for all the leaders out there, for all the employers and, and the supervisor out there who are have been struggling trying to connect with millennials, you, you're hearing it here. This is, this is a thought process. Evaluate how are you interacting. Evaluate your business practices. And can there be something that's adaptable? Can there be a little bit more flexible in the things that your business operations in order to be able to truly maximize the potential of our young leaders because they are our future. So I love that. Opportunity does not have to mean struggle. I, I'm going to use that one too. So I'm yes, putting that that's down. A, good one. That's, that, I that, that. That one into a couple of quotes for myself. That's yes. I was like, oh. yeah, that, that right there, <laughs> that right there is a good one. I, I love that. So tell us more about, about you and, and, and what you're doing, your products, your services, who you're serving. Um, and yeah, tell us, let's, let's learn more about that. Woo. Okay. That's so that's a heavy one. That's great. <laughs> All right. I've got an answer to that. I know you um, do. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, I am the CEO and founder of Ebby Danny Books. And what we focus on is ghostwriting. Um, that is our primary area of service. Our second is content strategy. And then our third is publishing. We started in publishing, um, started the publishing arm kind of in 2017. Yeah, so we're three years into the publishing part. Uh, but prior to making that the brand, I was always writing. I was doing communications. I've been the director of communications for arts organizations. I've done nonprofit work. Um, and the thing, again, that has been consistent, my consistent companion is writing and figuring out how to shape and share stories. And so that is my primary focus is shaping and sharing stories. The ghost writing piece, I serve a lot of high profile individuals um, because every, I won't say everyone needs a book, but books add credibility. Um, it has been proven that people see you as more of a leader ascribe more authority to you if you have something tangible for them to back it up to you. You're not just talking the talk, but you're you're showing it to them. So I sit with a lot of high profile individuals to help them shape and share their story, whether that's a personal story through a memoir or whether that is a corporate story where they're trying to get their brand and shape their brand into a particular trajectory. I assist them um, in that process. As far as content strategy, same thing. So 
organizations, small businesses, nonprofits, arts. I have a passion for the arts. That's like my my sweet spot. Um, so artists and entrepreneurs and creatives, supporting them and figuring out how to translate their message to someone else, right? Because oftentimes creative individuals and entrepreneurs just have a passion that's burning inside. And unless you're creative or an entrepreneur, that passion may or may not translate well to others. So I help figure out what does that look like? What does it look like in social media? What does it look like in an email that you send out? All right, great. You are this creative entrepreneur that has a really great tech company, a really great idea, and now you need people to give you money. So how are you going to change that great basement idea into something worthy and of value? And so I help people craft their stories in that way. Um, and then lastly is through publishing. I own an independent publishing house. Our focus is on memoirs, devotionals, and nonfiction works. Um, so again, that, that deep dig into helping people share who they are, where they've been, what they do. Um, a lot of high profile individuals, but then also some up and comers, some people that man, if only you knew what they had been through to get where they are. Um, mm -hmm. I was speaking with someone earlier and we were just talking about how many people we encounter in a day and how many of them we have no idea what they're experiencing or what they have experienced. And would we treat them any differently if we recognized all that they held within them beyond their current moment in which you encounter them? So helping people to, to share that in a courageous way, in an authentic way, um, because so many times it's, it's easy to get swept away in the hype and creating these lives or these looks, these experiences that match what we think someone wants us to look like or be. Um, I have found myself helping a lot of baby boomers who are like, I'm ready to tell my story my way now. Like this is how it all went down according to them, but here's the real truth. And that's mm -hmm. a liberating moment um, to be able to help them share those stories and say, you know what, for 30 years, I lived behind the wall of this particular assumption or this particular movement, and but this is where I really stand on it. And I'm, I'm finally ready to share that. So yeah, creatives, entrepreneurs, high profile leaders, all those good people um, are the people that I serve. I love it. And you also have a children's line, right? I do. The so so yeah, have tell us, tell us about that. <laughs> um, so this is where I think it all came together and made sense. I had my daughter, um, 2012, I had my son in 2016 and leading up to that, my daughter was really committed to, first of all, I can't do hair. Let me start there. That's my disclaimer. I can't do hair. And I mastered a bun because I was a dancer for years and over time, that became my daughter's go-to. She was like, huh, I want my hair in a bun. And I was like, but your fro is so natural. And everybody's being liberated right now. It's 2014, 2015, 2016. Let your fro go. And she was like, lady, <laughs> put my hair up in a bun. And what I realized, I had been in the classroom at that point seven or eight years. Um, and then was embarking on being a mom. I had been a mom at that point about four years. I did not see the children that I was teaching or the children that I was birthing. I did not see them in the media that they were seeing, the books that were on the classroom shelves, the books that were available in the books in the bookstores, um, the books to give them for Christmas, etc. They didn't feature black children. And that bothered me. It bothered me for a number of reasons. Number one, people don't care to learn from you until they learn that you care about them. And so if I'm a teacher and I'm trying to tell you that it's important for you to learn to read, but there's no book in my classroom that connects to you or that allows you to see yourself positively, um, I'm not reading. I'm not going to learn to read. There's going to be some defiance there. You mentioned it earlier about millennials shutting down. This next generation, What what's the generation after millennials? Z? Generation Z. Mm -hmm. Z. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They will like lights off, not eight, even hearing. Eight me. second ten attention span. Eight second attention span. And so yeah. for me, it was important to create books that had black, strong black characters on the front. 
not just a black character in the background off in the corner or something like that. I could go into all sorts of stats. Um, I'll leave, I'll throw this one out there, but as of 2016, there was a survey done that said that less than 6% of all children's books by, about black people or about people of color were written by black people. Six percent, six, not 16, not 60. Six percent. So, six percent, six percent. So, our stories were being told, but not by us. And I was like, no way. Um, and then that leads into how hard it is to get published traditionally as as an African American person, um, in the current state of the world. Mm -hmm. And it was important for me to create that and to create that outlet, to be able to share stories. And my goal was simple. I didn't want to write fantasy books. I mean, it's cool if the kid, you know, travels to the moon and meets a dragon. Those are some of my favorite books, but it was important to me that kids saw themselves doing everyday things, Mm. everyday things like brushing their teeth, combing their hair, going to school. Those were the things that captivated me. I wanted black kids to see, hey, you brushing your teeth every day is what we expect, but it's not anything weird. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to, Sally doesn't have to teach you how to go to the potty or Bill doesn't. There's so many more dynamics to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I subscribe to the windows and and mirrors theory about children's books, all books really. And that is that books are mirrors that allow us to see ourselves. And they're also windows that allow people to see into our lives and to learn about us. So if I can create a children's book that allows a kid to see themselves in a Mm -hmm. positive light, represented well, you know, with beautiful artwork, Um, with smiling faces, engaging, doing everyday things, if they can see themselves with that level of joy and then somebody else that's either never met a black person or never really engaged with one or has one black friend, you know, if they can see that we're normal, we tie our shoes and put on our pants one leg at a time, just like you do, Mm -hmm. the world is a better place, right? If a kid can realize that, if a parent can see it, if a teacher can share that book, I've done my job. If one person can see themselves reflected, if one kid can look through the mirror and learn something new about somebody else, man, what a world. What a world. Yes. I'm I'm all off. Listen, we could talk Uh about it. I love it. I love this is why we're here. This is why we're here talking about your moves that you're making. And and it, it. yeah, it's 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 an amazing and just the uh the why behind it. And as entrepreneurs, um and I, I train entrepreneurs and we have to know our why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And as entrepreneurs, we become problem solvers. Yeah. You saw a problem, right? You saw an issue that said that there are there are resources out there that does not resonate with my children or children that look like my children or children that look like me. And now that I, I have the ability to do something about it. And not only did you have the thought and the idea, you implemented and you took action and you, and you make it happen and you manifest it. And, and that's the thing that we want to get to the generation that the ideas that you have, the thoughts that you have are just not there for just as a coincidence, right? It's something that, you know, especially if it's a burning uh, sensation, a burning desire, a passion that you, it's reoccurring, then that's something that you want to truly harness and, and grow and, and, and work on and, and, and put into action and see where God can open the doors for you. And it's just amazing that you saw that that problem and took action to solve it. And I love that. I love that. Thank you. Me too. I There's yet more work to do, but it feels good to be doing the work even in the hard places, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's incredible, right? There's yeah. the thing that I experienced from seeing my kids be like, oh, this is my book or this is me. But there is another moment um, I've visited schools all over at this point. And when I go to schools that are predominantly white or predominantly Hispanic or predominantly Asian or something, there's always that moment where there's a kid that says, oh, that's me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 
man, what I wouldn't give for a million of those a day to see a kid say, oh, that's me. That's me. Mm. Man, that is. That's oh. awesome. That's awesome. So where can people, people out there listening, um, if you have children, if we're back at back in school, whether back virtual to school. or back to school, whether virtual or you, you're social distancing um, at, in the school and you're looking for books and looking for ex- different exposures, where can where can our audience find you? Sure. So I'm across all social media as at Evie Danny B. So that's E V Y. D-A-N-I-B. So that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Is that all the places you can be? LinkedIn. D-A-N-I-B, every Danny B. But as as my business evolves, I'm recognizing how important it is um, that I allow the children to have their own space that there are some things that are separate and sacred for them, um, teaching them to own their own space in the world. So I am growing my social media for the Adventures of Zoe and Zachary because I realize that that's a movement. That's all itself. Um, mm-hmm. And so that is on Instagram and Facebook as at the Adventures of Zoe and Zachary. Nice and long for you. <laughs> <laughs> And we will put it put that in the the comment section so you can um, go and visit. If you have young young children, young brown children, or anybody that wants the exposure, again, yeah. you're building awareness, and it's all about exposure. You know, there there there. I always say there are certain many things that's just learned behavior, and mm-hmm. and and the issues that we are dealing with their learned behavior. So at some point we have to break that cycle and doing things like this and exposing your children um, to, to, to things that they don't normally see is how we do it. So I commend you in taking on that charge and doing that. So definitely go out and support. Uh, Dude, the- Zachary goes to school. I'm going to jump in there. So back to school, you mentioned that. I have a book um, that is three years old now. It's called Zachary Goes to School. And it specifically features positive black male imagery. Mm. The cover is a dad and his son walking to the bus stop. The teacher is a black man making a difference in the classroom. Um, and it's a wonderful book that teachers have enjoyed. It breaks the ice. You know, all the kids come in at the at different levels. And so it breaks the ice and, and gives a really great opportunity. That one, I think I actually have it on special on Amazon right now. So go grab it, please, please, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And That's we'll my favorite it- plug because we're back to school. We're all trying to figure it out now. I love it. And we'll we'll definitely put that in the chat. I see Stephanie and Celeste is joining us. You guys put that in the chat so we, we can have that and people can go and support um, the v- adventures of Zoe and Zachary and all that she is doing with them. So let's continue as we're, we're winding down um, with our time. I just want to ask, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you clearly you have you're doing a lot as a mother, as an author, as a ghostwriter, as a publisher. So, what are some of the things that um, you would describe or you would do to overcome some of the challenges and obstacles that you face in the world? As an entrepreneur, or as just a person. Well, it could be both, however you want to answer. Because what, what I find is a lot of a lot of millennials, you know, when they get to that point where they get challenged mm-hmm. in life, right? Yeah. Rather than having the fortitude and the strength to keep moving forward, they now retreat. Yeah. And they get stuck. Ooh. So what are some of the things that that you have done in similar situations to propel you to that next level? So I think this is where that that um, that delineation between having older values and Mm -hmm. being a millennial began to conflict a little bit. Right. Because millennials, a lot of us are recognized as the trophy generation or as the participation trophy uh, generation. And I didn't come up that way Mm -hmm. or do what you got to do to get what you want to get. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I face those challenges, I don't have the opportunity to retreat. I I can't afford to retreat at this point, I'll say. And so I think for me, it is a matter of 
feeling the feelings and pressing forward anyway. Mm -hmm. Feeling the feelings of disappointment, feeling frustration, acknowledging those feelings, acknowledging I've, I'm disappointed in this space. Acknowledgement goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And pressing forward anyway. I think when we start to retreat is when we don't acknowledge those feelings. We we take on the feelings, we put them on and we wear them as a cloak and we hold on to them. We're so busy holding on to that feeling of disappointment or we're holding on to that frustration or that challenge, you know, that we face. We're holding on so tightly to what it's done to us and how how dare this challenge come up against me mm -hmm. that we don't let go. It's okay to acknowledge it and say, you know what? Gosh, this hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Man, this didn't go like I thought it was going to go. But this time, right, and to stretch it out and say, but next time I learned this. Um, next time I'm going to do it this way. When facing a challenge for me, it's also been being authentic. Mm -hmm. Who I am. I can't, I am likely not going to respond the same way to a situation as someone else. And so I can't compare my response to theirs. I can't say, well, I'm supposed to cry like they cry on, on, on TV when they get disappointed. Um, I don't have a life where like on TV, I can go away for seven days and cry, right? I got seven minutes at best with somebody mm -hmm. banging on the door type of some mom, are you all right in there? <laughs> Actually, I'm crying because I'm disappointed because I lost, you know, a deal that I was really excited about or the conversation mm -hmm. didn't go like I thought it was going to go. But I don't have seven days to wallow in that. I really have seven minutes or um, I think I posted this a couple of weeks ago. I was I was heartbroken. I had had probably. I had the toughest conversation that I had in a long time with a client and I was just. Oh man, I was torn up about it. I mean, mm -hmm. like, and I posted and I said, wipe your tears while you're doing it anyway. Mm. I still had to do the work. I had that conversation with her. It was like early in the morning, like nine or 10 o'clock. And it was one of those conversations that will truly wipe out your week. Like just, oh gosh, I'm not doing anything till this time next week while I get myself together. But I had to say, I got to do this work. I got to get this work done. I've got to reshift my priorities. Now mm -hmm. what was important isn't as important now that I've had this conversation, but this is. So let me shift my priorities. I'm going to cry while I'm shifting. I'm, and I did. Like I boo-hooed for the entire day, but mm -hmm. I didn't stop that day. I still had to parent. I still had other clients to still with to deal with. I still had work to do, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a challenge to be like, "How am I gonna get?" Like, it, I just wanted to get in the bed. Like I'm finished. This is never expected. This conversation. Yet here we are. I'm going to bed. I'm not doing anything else. But mm -hmm. the challenge was to wipe my tears and keep it moving. Not saying that I dismissed my feelings. I felt them. Like I literally, I think I cried for three days that week, at least, you know, but I still had to do the work. I still, mm -hmm. had to, I acknowledged I am sad. I am heartbroken. I am not feeling well. I'm still going to do this job. I'm still going to do the tasks that are ahead of me. That's how I face the challenges. I wipe the tears and keep it moving. Wipe it and let the tears drop, you know, just don't drop on the project I'm working on, please. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't, don't the computer, okay? Just, you know, I, I keep me a little, a little, I keep me a little cry rag, you know, no. my computer now, just in case, like, because I got to keep working, you know, I got to. I, I love I love that you said in it. And that's a part of a lot of the work that I do with helping um, young people develop their soft skills. And one of the things that we do is develop our self-awareness and knowing that, you know, we are human. Right. And we do have these feelings and it's OK to feel However it is that you feel, you know, a lot of times as, as, especially as young people, they feel so, so much pressure to 
be a certain way, to act a certain way, to act like they have it all together or have this facade that I have it all together because I can't let my parents know that I, I, I'm, I'm totally, you know, just freaking out or I'm frustrated. I can't let society know that I really don't have it all together and I don't know what I'm doing. So we bottle it all up. And then we we present this this front that we are, we're okay and we're really not. And we're seeing a lot of young people with that struggle. So I love the fact that you say that you go through the struggle, right? The struggles are there. You yeah. know, there we live in a world that we're not exempt from yeah. pain and suffering and challenging loss and failure and mistakes. Th th that happens. Mm -hmm. But it's the fact that you said that you acknowledge how you feel in the process acknowledge how you feel, get your cry on, yeah, wipe your tears, and then keep plunging and moving forward. I, I love that. I love that. Yeah, I'll say this. My life got better when I stopped pretending. Mm. My life got significantly better when I started to show up as myself consistently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if you say, how you doing, girl? <laughs> and I'm not okay. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> She's not okay. <laughs> we'll try. Look, call me tomorrow. You know, right. I had a conversation with a, a ghostwriter um, in the space. It's been three weeks now. And um, she said, she said, before we dive into our coffee conversation, I just want to see how you're doing. And I was like, oh, man, that's refreshing. And what we have decided is that our new norm, if we can make this our new norm, and she's a millennial millennial. Like, I was looking at her like, you really this young? But OK. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if we can make it the norm where we check in with people mm. or we dive in with people, man. If we could check in with people before we dive in with them. If I call mm. And I say, hey, Dr. Nick, how you doing today? If I really took a moment and said, do you have the capacity to chat something heavy with me today? Mm -hmm. Or how are you doing today? Do you have the space in your world to deal with this that I'm bringing to you? And being okay if you say, not today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can say, all right, cool. How can I support you in this moment? You know? Or I can say, all right, cool. I'm going to let you go. We'll reconnect. Wow. That's powerful. But, but if we can start our engagement by saying, how are you doing? And do you have the capacity for whatever the next thing is that I need yeah. or want from you? Like if we can start by acknowledging how we're feeling, where we're at and what we're doing, we might even realize that the thing that I called you about is probably not, it's, it's nothing compared to what you're already doing. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's powerful because as as people in general, we're mm -hmm. we're we're takers, <laughs> you know, and we we are, are are takers, and we have an affinity for self. So a lot of times, it's it's it takes um, time and it takes awareness to have that type of uh, uh, revelation to say, you know, as you're building relationships, this is what it's all about. It's, it's engaging in other people. It's, it's understanding the other person. It's connecting with the other person. Understand how they're feeling and what and what's going on in their life. And uh, that's powerful. I love that. So this is this has been awesome. <laughs> I, I, um, you always blow my mind. We have given some great nuggets, guys. Um, if you are out there, if you haven't watched the replay, because there has been some great nuggets that have been dropped. So there are two questions that I love to ask all oh, my guests, my millennials on the move. Was so, that on the list? Wait a minute. Yes, on the list. Yes, it's on the list. So as we're going to close out with these last two questions, and the last question is, if you can change one thing in the world, what would it be and why? If I could change one thing in the world. One thing. Just one. Just one. One? Just one. One today in this moment. That's it. That's all you got. Arrest the murderers of Breonna Taylor. Okay. All right. Let's I get like it that. Done. Why? Let's get it done. It's been too long. Okay. Okay. Why? Because it is high time that justice was equally served. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll because... Like yeah. Why? Because her life matters mm -hmm. today and every day. It's been what, 160 something days now? Yep. Yeah. Wow. That, that wouldn't be my one thing to, today. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. It might be different. It might be something different. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And our last question of the night is, what does adulting in my purpose mean to you? I'm going to tie it into my parenting philosophy, if there's such a thing. Mm -hmm. My parenting philosophy is that the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is exposure. Mm. So adulting in my purpose means taking the opportunity to be exposed to different things, to experience new things and then not to be afraid to apply them or to try them. That's adult Mm -hmm. purpose is is taking advantage of the exploration, the exposure and living it. You know, we don't know, we don't know what we like. We like what we know, but what if I knew something different? I might like Mm -hmm. something different. Mm -hmm. So I need to give her credit. Shout out to Sonia T. Cruel. (laughs) I love it exposure and, and being okay with exploration. I yep. love it. Yep. Well, that's, I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Danny Butler. Um, you again, you. Yeah, you guys, her website is posted. You can find her on social media at Evie Danny B. Um, Definitely go out and support children's books, uh, The Adventures of Zoe and Zachary that's coming out. And with you said that can be purchased on Amazon. Ooh, everything is on Amazon. Yeah, so I'm on Amazon, amazon.com slash author slash E. Danielle Butler. <laughs> okay, yeah, you got to let us know where we can, we can get to you and, yeah. and support you. So please go out and do that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing yourself um, and giving us some some golden nuggets and things to think about. And not only millennials, but anybody who is watching, um, the things that you have s- uh, shared are truly valuable and added value to, to the lives of many as well as myself. So I thank you for continuing on to do your purpose and adulting in your purpose. And I, I love to watch your journey. I'm always proud and excited for you. So may God continue to open the doors and bless you where you need to. So thank you again for coming on and uh, adulting in my purpose. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to doing this again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, that is the end of our session. What an amazing, I told you guys, we we are doing this. Millennials make it move. This is going to be one of the best segments that we have. So we're going to continue to bring some amazing uh, millennials who are out in the, the marketplace doing their thing, truly adulting in their purpose. So you can see that you can do it too. You can be equipped, you can be empowered, and you can be inspired to, to truly live your best life in the, the life that God has called you. So next week, we're here again um, uh, at one Wednesday at 830 Eastern Standard Time for for those that are watching from other places. Um, If you haven't uh, gotten the journal, um, Adulting in My Purpose is on Amazon.com. You want to go and and get that. Looks like... (laughs) Adulting in my purpose. Uh, There we go. Uh, Available on Amazon.com. Also, uh, the Adulting in My Course uh, Purpose course is available. So go ahead and register if you're wanting to go to the next level. If you're wanting to take time to grow yourself, to increase your your self awareness, uh, register for the course. It's it's time that. you invest in yourself because if you don't do it, nobody will, right? So the course is available. The journal is available, guys. So support that, get that, and let's grow together. So thank you, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful, blessed night. Again, it was always a pleasure for us to be adulting in a purpose. And thank you, Danny. Thank you.